Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the power you make available to us, greater than we understand, greater than we recognize, and greater than any of us has yet to experience. Your power is available. So speak to us tonight of that resurrection power that is alive in the hearts and the lives of all who believe and unleash your power in a fresh new way that we would live for you and follow you and love you and shine your light. Thank you, Jesus, for the power you unleashed when you died on the cross, when you conquered sin and death, and when you rose again. We give you praise. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Uh, we had some at the doors as you came in, and hopefully you grabbed one of those. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be on page 1,184, if you picked up one of the Bibles on your way in. Page 1,184. And I want to challenge you on nights of worship to always make it a point to bring your Bible or grab one on your way in because we're going to have the Word of God open in front of us. And it'd be good if you have your own Bible, just because you can kind of take some notes and jot some things down. Or if you don't want to write in your Bible, if that's a problem for you, have a little sheet of paper you can tuck right there and have to look at in the future. We are going to talk about living a resurrection lifestyle. And the fact that you look different because you are different when you walk in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to look in just a moment at Colossians 3, 1 through 11. We're going to read that whole passage. But I want to begin by just telling you a little story. My wife and I... I visited with some friends, this is some years ago, and we hadn't seen them for about a year. We hadn't seen these friends for about a year. And of the couple, the wife, in that one year, she had, she had aged about 15 years. When we saw her, we noticed something was different. She looked about 15 years old, and she kind of said to us, she said, yeah, I, I made a decision, I'm just owning my age. I'm just owning my age. You know, no more dye for my hair, you know, kind of no more young people clothes, I just, I'm just going to own it. And I didn't want to say anything, but she was owning it. <laughs> and about a year later, we saw him, and she wasn't owning it anymore. She was about 15 years younger again. <laughs> you, say, you say, well, you ever met someone, and you don't want to say anything, but you go, you look, you don't say it, but they're, they look different, you know? You, know, they, you, you lost 70 pounds. Whoa! Or, you, or you, your, your hair was there, now it's gone. Whatever it is, you know, something, something changed. And you recognize it, right? Well, what I want to talk about today from, from Colossians 1, 1 through 11, is this idea that when someone sees you, and you've come to know Jesus, and another week or month or year has gone by, they should look at you and say, whoa, something changed. You're not the same. You are not who you were last time I saw you. And it's not how much hair you have or how much gray you have or whatever it is. It's something entirely different. It is that reality that when the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is in us, we don't stay the same. Sin begins to go away and change and our, and our freedom and willingness to sin begins to die. Holiness begins to take over. Our mouths speak differently. Our minds think differently. Our hearts beat differently. And I think, no, I know that none of us here are fully realizing the transformational power of the resurrection the way God wants us to. Not one of us is fully there. I really believe that God is inviting us into a more transformed life. And it's not just a saying, I don't look like the world, that should be part of it, but I don't even look like myself anymore. And you don't even look like yourself. So you, well, I know you are like that, and you're just not the same. If you're married, your spouse should be saying, you're not the same, and that's a good thing. I mean, you're changing. Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, and I want you to notice the transformational expectation that God has of people who have walked in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who've come to the cross and received Jesus. And I want you to notice in this passage, and if you're a note taker, you may want to kind of make note of certain things where God's doing something to change you and where you're doing something to partner with God to see you change. You hear what I said? Notice here that there's sometimes where it says God's done something, and sometimes it says, and now you do something. There's this partnership with God. Verse 1, since then, 
You have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And set your minds, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death. This is severe language. So put to death, therefore, whatever. Whatever. What fits under whatever? A lot. So put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he gives some examples. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Now listen to this. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. Notice the past tense there. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now, but now you must also rid yourselves, we're not done yet, of all such things as these. And this all such things is a broad topic, and he's giving some specific examples, but it's bigger than just these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Someone say amen. amen. I mean, wow. Did, did, does that rally you? Does it shake you up? Does it inspire you? I'm not sure exactly what it does to you, but the point the apostle Paul is making with absolute clarity is that we are changed because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice something, that, that there's a source of power for our transformation. This passage gives a lot of examples. There, there, there's this source of power, and you go, well, I can't transform myself. Well, part of it you don't have to do. Part of it's God's part. But part of it we do have to do. In partnership with the Holy Spirit and walking in the power of God and the power of the resurrection, resurrected Jesus Christ, we make decisions every day to take off the old and put on the new. And then we look in the mirror and we go, man, I got the old back on again. <laughs> Peel it off. Put on the new. How many times do you have to do that? Five times, maybe? You're all there? A thousand times? I don't know. It, it, there's a sense in this passage that it's an ongoing journey. Theologians call this sanctification. Sanctification is the ongoing process of becoming more and more like Jesus. And guess what? You're not there yet, and neither am I. Not perfectly. Now, in God's eyes, through Christ, our sins are washed away. Amen. That's done. Signed, sealed, delivered. And when God the Father looks at you, at the end of time when he looks at you, he will say, sinless, because he'll see you through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen? Amen. That's good news. But on this journey of life, we are still growing to be like Jesus, and we are growing in holiness. And so what's the source of our power for transformation? Well, look, look at the passage and look at the screen kind of together. Here's the source of our power. You have been raised with Christ. Look at verse one. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. That's part of the source of our power, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's broke the power of sin, death, and hell. We are no longer slaves of sin. So you've been raised with, he's been raised, you've been raised with him. Powerful. As a matter of fact, we're going to have three baptisms tonight. With each baptism, the person's going to go under the water. It's a picture of dying to sin, dying to the old life, dying to the old ways. And when the person comes out of the water, and you better say amen and clap when they do, because that's a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. New life, new hope, new power. And that moment is to be remembered the rest of your life because it's a physical symbol of the spiritual reality that in Christ we die to sin and we rise to get a new life. So we're gonna do three baptisms in a little bit and that's gonna be a celebration. So, source of your power. You've been raised with Christ. What else? You have died to your old way of life. Look at verse three. Verse three says, 
For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You have died. There's something spiritually that has died. There's an old life that has died. That's part of what's happened. And then also in verse 3 we read, your new life is hidden with Christ in God. There's a sense that Christ wraps around you and protects you. There's power in Jesus Christ. His resurrection, his presence with you now. But also, what's our source for resurrection power to walk in this? You are setting your heart on God's things. Look again at verse 1. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated in the right hand of God. Part of this journey in resurrection power is, is I, am, I am taking my heart and I'm setting it on things above. I'm setting it on the things of Jesus. I don't have to tell you that all day long, every single day, there are a thousand things screaming Give me your heart. Give me your devotion. Give me your love. And it comes in every shape, every size, every inanimate object, every tasty treat, every kind of temptation. It says, just give me your heart. And part of our journey to walk in the resurrection power of Jesus is saying, my heart will belong to Jesus alone, so I will set my heart on things above. But there's more than that. You're focusing your mind on things above. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You make a decision, I'm going to think about, because what you think about will guide your feet. What you think about will guide your hands. What you think about will guide your spending. What you think about will guide your free time. What you think about will determine everything about you. And so the apostle Paul says, set your mind on things above. How often do we think about the glory of heaven. Not enough. How often do we think about heavenly worship? What's going on in God's presence? I don't know, but boy, let me, let my, let me just look at, look at the scriptures. Let me read a little bit of Revelation and get freaked out and twisted around, but going, wow, it's, something's going on there. It's incredible. Let me think about the fact that Jesus is always interceding for me. Do you know he's praying for you, interceding for you? Let me think about, the, let me think about what is happening in, in, in the place of God. Because we think so much about what's right in front of us. And the Apostle Paul is saying, get your heart above, get your mind above, listen closely. This does not mean all you ever do is sit around and just think about heaven. That's not the point at all. This is while you're at the hospital working as a nurse, you know there's more. And your heart and your mind are on the things of Jesus. While you're in the classroom teaching children or adults, you're profoundly aware that as wonderful as this is, there is more beyond this. And your heart and your mind, you're engaging with the living God. It means when you're out pulling wire or laying carpet or, or, or plumbing pipe or whatever it is you do, while you're, while you're serving in the military, while you're serving as a homeschool teacher, and while you're serving in whatever environment, your heart and your mind are always aware there's more than this. And as a matter of fact, this will be a whole lot better if my heart and my mind can stay on things above. I, I told my wife before we got married, if I'm not, I, I told her, I will always seek to love Jesus before you and more than I love you. Because if I can't do that, I cannot love you well. And it's true. When my heart and my mind wander from Jesus, I am not the husband I need to be. But when my heart is on the things above and my mind is on the things above, I can love my, my wife well. I can do my work well. I can be a better dad. I can be a better person, just the person I bump into along the way or whoever's driving ahead of me really slowly. Um, I can, I can, I'm a different person when my heart and my mind are on the things that are above, and so are you. So what, what Paul's not talking about here is cutting off all human contact, going and moving into a cave, and just kind of meditating on God and forgetting the world. What he's talking about is you live in this life, but you live in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And he is in you, and he is with you, but your part, is to get your heart and your mind on things that are above. And there's all kinds of things crying for our attention. We have to be conscious about this and think about it. And then, verse 5, he says, you're putting things to death. This is part of the journey of walking in the transformational power of the resurrection. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, put to death, therefore, <coughs> whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Put to death. There's a part of us that's saying, okay, what is it that belongs to my earthly nature that's not what God wants? And we're going to talk about this more in a minute. But I'm called to put that to death. 
What does that mean? We'll come back to that. But this is part of our part in the journey. And I want to say, as we talk about different things, and we're going to have some kind of quiet moments where you can just reflect and ask God to speak to your heart about the areas that you need to grow in, the areas that you need to surrender to God. Those things, and, and there's going to be something tonight, I believe this, if you come before God tonight and say, God, what is something in my life that I need to put to death? And God will give you not only what that is, he'll, he'll convict you in your heart, and some of you, God's going to argue, oh, you know what it is, because I've been telling you this for a long time, today's the day. There's something you have to put to death to leave behind, okay? But putting that thing to death is kind of like any monster or any creature in a sci-fi movie that gets shot or killed or lasered and is laying there dead. And the person who shot them then drops on the ground, drops their weapon, and sits there innocently, and you're watching, and you're looking at the monster, and you're looking at them, and you're thinking, what are you thinking to yourself? Then it's not dead. Have you ever had that? I mean, it's, it's, never, it's never dead. You go, there's 15 more minutes in the movie or whatever, and you're going, it's not dead. And, and all of a sudden, bah! And there it is again. I want to challenge you with that image in your mind, whatever it is God calls you to put to death, when you think you've got it killed, I'm going to tell you, it's not dead. So stay on your toes and keep watching because it will be back again. And you'll need to continually surrender to Jesus Christ. You're putting things to death. And then verses 9 and 10, you're taking off your old self and you're putting on your new self. Look at verses 9 and 10. It says, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. It's a constant process of taking off the old and putting on the new. Taking off the old and putting on the new. Well, pastor, what's my old thing I have to take off? Here's my answer. Listen closely. I have no idea. But you know. And the Holy Spirit knows. And if you ask God, what's an old thing I gotta take off? God's gonna tell you. And some things you just got to take off and kind of throw to the side. Some things you got to take off and kill. Because it's a powerful thing controlling your life. And you put it to death again and again and again. And then what, what, well, pastor, what do I have to put on? What's the new thing that right now Jesus wants for me to take on and put on in my life? I don't know. It may be a mo more robust and focused prayer life. If God tells you that, that's it for you. It, it may be humbly serving people in your home because you're all about yourself. And if that's it, put it on. And put it on and put it on. And maybe taking a heart that is, is Grinch-like in its, in its selfishness and lack of in kind of greed and lack of generosity and saying, God, you're calling my heart to, to grow to where I can share and be generous. I've got to put on a generous spirit. I don't know what it is for you, but I know there's something God wants you to take off and there's something he wants you to put on. And that's going to be a lifelong journey, but tonight could be the time that you take a next step forward. So I want you to notice that God does his part and we do our part. That's the way it works on the journey of faith. That's the way it works to, to walk in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead. You couldn't do that. Right? If you agree, I want to get an amen. He rose from the dead. You didn't. Amen. amen right? He paid for the power. He paid the price for sin, and you couldn't. Amen? amen? Yeah, absolutely. He, he conquered sin, death, and hell, and you couldn't. But he calls you to put certain things to death, to take certain things off, and to put certain things on. Someone say amen. amen. He does. I want you to imagine a scene in a restaurant. You're sitting and you're kind of watching this family over here. And there's a dad and a mom and there's a, a baby. And the dad and mom are sitting at the table and the baby's in the high chair and it comes time to eat. And, 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 and the mom you know, gets out the baby food and does, you know, is feeding the baby food. And you go, oh, that's really cute. That's really sweet. And she's feeling really patient feeding her baby. And you go, oh, that's wonderful. Because the baby... Can't do that yet. But I want you to imagine the same scene. And the baby is now 15. And perfectly healthy. And the mommy's cutting up the food, saying, honey, take a little bite. Oh, that's too much for you. And the mommy kind of chews on it. Mm, here, honey. There you go. Kind of slides in the baby. You know, like, a, like a mommy bird chewing the food up. And then, you know, and, the, and, and you watch it. And, 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 the, and the child says, mom, mom, give me more. Give me more. And they're, perf I mean, they're perfectly healthy. And now they're 15. Anybody here watching that is going to say, something's wrong, right? You're going to say, that, that's not right. That, that, of course, the parent still can feed, feed, uh, feed the baby, but the parent shouldn't. The child should start feeding themselves. Christ has done his part. 
He bore your sins. He took your sin. He carried the cross. He conquered sin and death and hell, and he rose again. Praise God. Now he said, yeah, give me an amen. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. That's good news. Now he says this. I'm going to place my Holy Spirit in you, and you can walk in the power of my resurrection. So, so step up and grow up in your faith. Go deeper in your faith. And peel that thing off that shouldn't be on you. Put on what should be on you. So let God speak to you tonight. And this passage, the Apostle Paul gives examples. He's not giving every possible sin or challenge. He's saying stuff like this and this and this and this. You get the point? Take it off. Put the right thing on. And so I want to just pause and I want to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. And so let's just quiet our hearts. And would you just say quietly in your heart. And I want to ask you to pray this prayer. Quietly in your heart. Holy Spirit of God. Show me what needs to die in me. Show me the power of your resurrection over sin. Show me what I need to take off, even if I'm taking it off for the hundredth time. Show me. Ask him to do that. Show me what I should put on to grow in spiritual maturity. Speak to me, God. Empower me by your spirit. Let me walk in the strength of your resurrection. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So what does it mean to put things to death? Look at verse five. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he gives some examples. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. That's a big one, just any evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. And, and here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, put it to death. Let me, give you some, let me give you some ways to look at that. Kill it. Starve it. Crucify it. Give it a funeral. You're done. You're not part of my life anymore. Now, every one of us has certain things that we've walked away from, and we say, that's not me anymore. In the power of Jesus, I'm walking away from it. And every one of us has other things that we still dabble with. Or that we still wear, like a, not like a, like a coat, but like a, like a straight jacket, you know? But we put it on every day. And we keep walking it. And we know it's not God's way for us, but there it is. And the Apostle Paul says, put it to death. And again, when you put it to death, it may pop up again, then kill it again. You say, well, that sounds so violent. It is. It's a battle. But we walk in the power of the resurrection, and Jesus already won the war. We're just trying to walk in, in, in the ways of Christ. I, as I was thinking about this, a picture came to my mind. I don't remember the name of the movie. It was, uh, I think it was, it, was, it was one of the early Christian movies that came out, and it's a, fire, a group of firefighters, but the one guy who's the main character, he's battling with pornography. And his wife knows he's battling, and he knows he's battling, and he finally comes to the place where he's gonna deal with pornography. And there's this beautiful scene where he's out in the front of his house, and he's taking his computer, and he set it, I think it was on top of the trash can. And he's taking on a baseball bat. And he beats his computer into little pieces. He kills it. He, cry, he destroys it. And his neighbor's watching just thinking he's gone out of his mind. But for this guy in this moment, he says, the only way I can overcome this, and that was, that was the conduit at that time. Now the problem is the conduit is every phone, every tablet, every computer, every TV. The problem is it's all over the place. But for this guy, the picture was this, I'm going to war, and if this is what it takes, I will crush my computer. But he, he said, I'm killing this thing. I'm going after it. I'm dealing with it. Is there something in your life that you've got to take a bat to, that you have to go to war against? And would this be the day that God would call you to do it? We need to get our minds, our hearts, and our actions, specifically here the Apostle Paul says, off sexual sins. He talks about sexual immorality, impurity, which is a broad term, and lust, all the stuff that happens in our minds. So here's two questions. And I want to linger on this topic between us and the Lord. What am I doing that fuels and feeds sexual sin? Whether it's immorality, and if you have your Bibles open, look at verse five, immorality, impurity, or lust. Sexual actions, anything that's impure, and then thoughts that don't, don't honor God in, in the realm of sexuality. Here's the question. What am I doing that fuels and feeds sexual sin? And what can I do to starve sexual sin and temptation? How do I cut off the source of that? 
And I want you to just take about 30 seconds, and, and if, if this isn't your area of challenge, we've got about five minutes left, we'll try to get to one of yours, okay? <laughs> but just quiet your heart, and if you know somebody who struggles with this, pray for them, or just think on your own heart, what am I doing that fuels that? How do I starve it? How do I cut this off? Lord Jesus, hear our hearts. In this culture, in this world where what is available is just staggeringly scary. That five and six and seven year old kids with two clicks of a button of a phone, if they go to the wrong place, could download a world of just craziness. Speak to our hearts about how we need to get rid of and cut off and deal with this if it's an issue in our lives. Just take a moment with you and Jesus. Some of you just keep reflecting on that. If, that. if God's speaking to you about that, if that's an area in your life, just talk to the Lord. Think about it. And I'll add another one to that list. Scrutinizing our desires when they're evil. If you desire, if you want things, and you think, I don't know if that's what God wants me to be wanting, but I really want it. I desire what's wrong, the evil. And the question you'll see on the screen is, how can I evaluate my desires and determine if they're evil? If there's something right now that you've been just, just kind of obsessing over, I really want, I gotta have, I need, I need, I want, I want, I just, it's, it's just driving you, driving you. Take a moment right now and just say, Lord, search my heart. Is this thing I'm desiring? You know, must I have that? Must, if you just feel like it's driving you, talk to God and say, God, is this desire from you? Or is this out of a, a heart that just always wants more? Just talk to the Lord about that just for a few moments. And we'll add something else to that as well. you're thinking about that, and if the Lord has you there, just linger there and just talk with him and think about that. For others, I want you to think, here's another topic that might get you thinking. Confessing and turning from our greed. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul calls greed idolatry, because if we love something more than we love Jesus, it becomes an idol. And that's one of the biggest warnings in the Bible. You can't love both God and stuff, mammon. So there's two questions on the screen if this is maybe strikes a chord for your heart. Where is greed alive in my heart and my lifestyle? A more, more, gotta have it, gotta have it. More for me, less for others. More for me, less for God. And then how do I battle my tendency to be greedy? It's just between you and the Lord. And he knows, so don't hide it from him. Maybe that's your topic. Just talk with him for a minute about that, about sexual immorality, about desires that are not honoring to God, about greed. Just take a moment and just say, God, speak to my heart. For some of you, God's already putting another topic that I haven't mentioned, but God said, this is it for you. This is the take it off put on a new spirit. This is the put it to death for you. Talk to God about that. And I want to finish our study tonight by reading verse 7 to you. And just keep your, keep your heart quiet before the Lord. And listen to these words. This is hopeful. The Apostle Paul says, listen to the tense of these words. You used to walk in these ways. In the life you once lived. He's saying that's not who you are anymore. Those things can become a thing of the past, but you have to battle them. You have to take them off. You have to put on new things. He goes on to talk about, he gives other examples, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, lying. You used to live, to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. The point is, that's not who you are anymore. Oh, Lord, as we prepare to celebrate baptism, as we get a living picture right in front of us of what we're talking about, this picture of dying to sin and rising again to new life. God, will you speak to us? Will you remind us of when we were baptized? Or will you challenge us to get baptized? 
because, Lord Jesus, we want to walk in the power of the resurrection. We want to remember that there are things that we are called to die to and things that we are called to live to. And so, God, for each of us, I pray that not one Christian will leave here tonight without hearing your spirit gently say, this is it. This is the attitude. Put it to death. Starve it. End it. Take it out of your life. This is the action. You've died to that. Rise in the power of Jesus. This is the thought pattern. Put it to death and think in new ways. Lord Jesus, as we now celebrate baptism, we pray that you would remind us of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his glorious name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Romans 6, 3 says this as we come to baptism. The Apostle Paul says, don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus? We were baptized into his death. That picture of going under the water, a picture of being baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. That is good news. Listen to what Paul goes on to say in verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, and if we've come to the cross, if you receive Jesus, you have been united with him in a death like his. We will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. That resurrection power is now, and it also comes at the end of our lives. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You are not a slave to sin if you're a child of God. You may feel some days like you are. You may feel some weeks and months like you are. You are not a slave to sin. And in this moment, as you celebrate these baptisms, remember your baptism. Remember that you came to Jesus. You received him. You went under the water. You came out of the water. And you were alive in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Enjoy these testimonies. Celebrate the baptism. And when each person comes out of the water, that's a sign of the resurrection. Let's give a resurrection celebration as each person comes out of the water. Our first baptism tonight is Teresa Lugo. Teresa came to know Christ almost 10 years ago and wants to be baptized tonight to show her full commitment to Jesus. She is thankful to God for showing her unconditional love and for being her hope and her savior. baptize you tonight in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Stop being baptized is Isabella Salvador. Isabella became a follower of Jesus in January when she learned the good news of Jesus from reading the Bible. Isabella shared with us that Jesus has helped her in the rough times of life and that he is her savior. Isabella, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. up being baptized is Bonnie Broderick. Bonnie started following Christ at a young age, but recently has decided to rededicate her life to God. Bonnie shared with us that Jesus gives her strength and purpose, and that he is her shepherd and her savior. Bonnie, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 